If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, would you please turn to the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 12 through 26 together. Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. And by the way, choir, that was an outstanding song this morning. The thoughts and the words and all of the parts of that. I'd actually planned, when I was first thinking about the Lord's Supper today, uh, I thought... Uh, because I never know what the choir is going to do, but that just goes, that went so well with uh, the service this morning. I never know what they're going to do, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna, the choir is going to sing, and it's going to be just what it needs to be, and it was, and it was beautiful. And I said, I think I'm going to just, I'm going to have the Lord's Supper, we'll talk about the Lord's Supper, and that'll be, that's going to be the service. And I mentioned something to Debbie about, you know, I think I'm going to just do a, just a little short sermonette. We'll have the Lord's Supper and we'll be dismissed. Debbie said, I don't know about it. So, if this is a little bit longer than you thought it would be, it's Debbie's fault. <laughs> you know, I really, I really, when I sit down to prepare, I, I really, that's exactly what I was headed towards. And the more that I read this scripture and, and the more that God spoke to my heart about it, it's just like, Man, we need to remember this, and we need to remember this, and we need to remember this. It's just not something that we can slide out of this, or something that we can push away, uh, or whatever, and, and not cover. So, uh, let's jump in as we uh, as we share God's word together this morning. The Gospel of Mark, chapter fourteen, starting in verse twelve, it says that on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him. Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. And where he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upstairs room, unfurnished and ready, prepared for us there. The disciples left and came to the city and found everything just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him, one by one, surely not I. But he said to them, it is one of the twelve. The one who dips bread with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is going away just as it is written about him. But woe to the, that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Verse 22 says that while they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is being poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would just... Uh, Lord God, open our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we would see every thought and every idea in your word this morning, Lord, that it would just, uh, Lord, that it would just speak to us in a, in a real and, and mighty way, Lord, as we prepare to come to this table in this service, Lord, we ask you to help us to truly look at ourselves, look at those sitting around us. 
Lord God, looking up at you, making sure, Lord, that we have done as you would have us to do. Lord, that we would examine ourselves. Lord, that we would give forgiveness and ask for forgiveness. Lord, that we would honor you in all that we do as we come to your table. Father, I ask now that you would give me clarity of speech and clarity of thought. Lord, that your word would go out unhindered from this place. Father, I ask now that you would bind Satan and set him outside this place. Lord, that he'd have nothing to do here today. And Lord God, I ask now that you would have your way with us here in this very moment, in this very place. And Lord God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our text this morning, the Lord Jesus gathers his disciples together to partake of the last meal that he's going to ever take on this earth uh, or, or at, at this time in, in, this, in his first coming. We know that he's going to come back. We know that he's going to come back, but this is, he's partaking of his last meal before he goes to the cross. This meal that Jesus Christ eats on the eve of his death is a meal that was designed by God to exalt God the Son. Right? It had a, it, God, God put all this in place. It didn't just happen because it was, it, was, uh, it was time for it to happen, but it was part of God's plan. It's a meal that preaches the gospel. Even if I didn't add another single word to this, and we read this, and we know about what this table does, and what it is, and what it's about, it preaches to us. It preaches the gospel. It preaches salvation. It is a meal that displays the grace of an almighty God. It is a meal that, uh, that signifies the creation of a new covenant between God and repentant sinners. There's a lot going on here at this table, but let's don't get all the stuff of the world confused with what God's trying to do for us here through His Son, Jesus Christ. That is to bring us unto salvation through grace and to know that Christ is Within us. He lives within us. If you're a Christian, he lives within us. Our text says this morning that, that, that the disciples came to Jesus. They came to Jesus and, and they wanted to know where he wanted to observe the Passover meal. Now let's don't get let's don't get the Last Supper and the Passover meal confused. That's two totally different things now. All right? So they want to know where are we going to observe the Passover meal? The Passover meal was the Main feast of the Jewish year, the Jewish religious year. It was to be held on the 14th day of the first month of the Jewish calendar. Now, the first month of their calendar roughly lines up or corresponds with April in our modern, in our modern day calendar today. The Passover was a feast designed to, we all know what it was. We all know that it was a, a feast designed to commemorate the night that God passed over Israel when the angel of death, the death angel, destroyed the firstborn of Egypt during the last of the ten plagues God sent to judge Egypt. And that's what the Passover was about. It's a, it's a time of, of remembrance, a time of commemoration. And the, here's the rules of, for the Passover. They go something like this. And the rules of Passover, by the way, are found in Exodus chapter 12. So I would encourage you to go there and and look at that and, and, and know about that and read that. But according to these verses in chapter 12, every family in Israel was to take, uh, take part in the, in the Passover. Uh, and, and here were the, they were to take part in the following steps. Here's what they would do. They were to choose a lamb which was to be killed on the evening of the Passover. And then they were to take the blood of the lamb and Put some on the doorpost of their homes. They were to roast the lamb over a fire and eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. They were to eat this meal dressed for a journey. With their shoes on. With their shoes on. Their walking sticks in hand and they were to eat it as if though they were in a hurry. Ready to go at a moment's notice. And the meal would go something like this. They, would, they drank a cup of red wine mixed with water at the beginning. And they were 
Uh, th this was a, and then they would have a ceremony, a ceremonial, I had trouble with that word, a ceremonial washing of hands, which symbolized the need for spiritual and moral cleansing. Get right, clean hands, clean hands, and a and a pure heart. They ate the bitter root, the uh, the bitter herbs, which symbolized their bondage. In Egypt, they drank a second cup of wine, at which time the head of the household would explain the meaning of Passover. And this didn't take a few minutes. It was it was quite a lengthy, it was quite a lengthy uh, ordeal. And after they had that second cup of wine, and they talked about the explanation of the meaning of the Passover, that they, they would then sing the first of two psalms. Psalm 113 and 114. Next, the lamb was brought out. And the head of the household distributed pieces of it with the unleavened bread. And then the unleavened bread symbolized, uh, symbolized haste. That's what the unleavened part was. That they were, there was no time to allow the dough to rise before the journey would begin. It had to be done in a hurry. They had to be ready right now. And then they drank a third cup of wine. And then they would conclude the meal by singing the rest of Psalm 115 through 18. Now this was the meal that the disciples were asking Jesus about. That meal I just described. That was the events that were going to unfold that evening. And that is the meal that the disciples were Asking Jesus about how, where and how are we going to prepare for this. You see, Orthodox Jews still observe the Passover the very same way it's been observed for thousands of years. Sadly, they are oblivious to its symbolic meaning. You see, in that day, they were still looking for the Messiah today. They are still looking for the Messiah, but yet on that day he stood before them, but was rejected. This feast, it involved a lamb. That lamb was to be without blemish, Scripture tells us in Exodus. This is a picture of perfection and purity. This lamb speaks of the lamb it speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is also without blemish. He is, he is perfect. He is perfection. He is sinless. And he is our Savior. The lamb was to be slain and its blood applied to the doorpost of the house. The family was to uh, gather inside the house and they were to eat that meal together inside the house. And when the death angel passed through the land to to kill all the firstborn, those who were in, in homes in the, uh, with the blood on the door, uh, uh, with the door header, uh, were, would be safe. And the angel would pass by. That was, that was the sign to the angel to pass by that door. This is a picture of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for us. We need to understand that the only shelter anyone in that day and in this day, the only shelter anyone can have against the wrath of an almighty God is the blood of Jesus. Look, if you ever hope to be saved, I hope you are saved. But if you're here this morning and you ever hope to be saved, you must come to Jesus by faith. And when you do, His blood washes away every sin. What can wash away my sins? What can make me white as snow? right nothing but the blood of Jesus 
Jesus sent two disciples to make the arrangements for the Passover. And from the Gospel of Luke, we know that those two disciples were Peter and John. So Peter and John, they went into the city and they found a house. They did as Jesus told them to do. They found that man and that man took them to that house. And Jesus and the rest of the twelve arrived later to celebrate the Passover. Jesus used this opportunity to try and teach Judas or try to reach Judas one final time. You know something we don't talk about a whole lot uh, when we come to the Lord's table is is how in in all of that night, as, as all 12 of them gathered together, that Judas was still there. Judas knew what he was going to do, and God knew what Judas was going to do. Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. But look, regardless of that, God saw all the way to the end of that, but regardless of that, Jesus still continued to reach out to Judas one more time. Let me ask you something. Are there people in your life that you have given up on? And you just said, I'm not, I'm not reaching out anymore. I, I, I'm just going, you know, what they got is what they got. What if, what if? Look, I'm not talking about Judas now. I'm talking about me and you. What if Jesus had said that about me? I'm done with him. And look, he could have. He, I, I, I deserved everything. I deserved every uh, separation from, from Almighty God that there is. But Jesus said, no, I'm not giving up on you. One more time, I'm going to ask you. And look, here's a great example. Jesus issued a call to Judas to turn from his wicked plan. Judas is given a chance to repent. The spotless Lamb of Christ sees enough in Judas to give him one more chance. Don't you think maybe we could try to do that with people in our lives as well? Notice the Lord's words in verse 21. He says, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born at all. Judas would have been better off if he'd have never even lived than to have lived and died lost. It wasn't the betrayal, it was the rejection. You know, the same is true for every man woman, boy, and girl, for every person who's ever drawn a breath in this world. To live without Jesus is a terrible thing. Listen to me. To live without Jesus is a terrible thing. But to die without Jesus is a tragedy. It's a tragedy greater than the mind can comprehend. Jesus, he reached out to Judas to stop him from going to hell. I want you to know that Jesus is still reaching out. He's still reaching out to you and to me and to every man, woman, boy, and girl. He does not want not one single one to perish. He's done everything that needs to be done to prevent us from that end. He died on the cross to pay for our sin. He rose from the dead to grant us eternal life. He has given us His Word uh, to, about His... He has given us His Word to tell us about His Gospel. And He sent His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to convict us of our sins and to draw us unto Him. Jesus used this occasion of the Passover to institute a new covenant. All right, here's where the change starts happening. Before we're talking about the Passover meal, and now we're talking about, he's getting ready to talk about what's, what we know today as the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. In this passage, 
Jesus teaches his disciples and the rest of us what the new covenant is all about. On this day, Jesus added a new meaning to the bread when he said, Take, eat, this is my body, he said, broken for you. Jesus used the bread that night to teach his disciples about what was about what, what was about to, what he was about to do, what was about to happen. He was on his way to the cross to lay down his life for sin. You understand, nothing like this in the entire world had ever happened before. There had been those that came before to, to show us and point us and bring us to Jesus, to, to point the world to Christ. But, but on this night, at this table, Jesus was about to pay for our sins. He was on his way to Calvary where his body would be broken for you. Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 4 and 6 say, However, it was, it was our sicknesses that he himself bore and our pains that he, that he carried. Yet we ourselves assume that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoing. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on Jesus wanted us to know that his broken body was more important than just a piece of bread. He wanted us to understand that the only way to have salvation was to become part of him. To allow him to come and live in us by receiving what he did on the cross by faith. That's how we become part of him and he becomes part of us. That is why he said, take, eat. We must receive what he did for us. On that day, Jesus added a new meaning to the drinking of the wine. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. When Jesus was crushed on the cross, when Jesus was crushed on the cross, his precious blood was shed. It was poured out. It literally drained out of his body. And when the blood was shed, God was satisfied. Now all who believe in Christ Jesus for salvation have their sins washed away. Washed away by the blood of Christ. They are instantly brought into a new relationship with an almighty God. A new relationship. See, God takes the righteousness of Christ and he takes that righteousness of Christ and he applies that to the account of the repentant sinner. That's you and me. We were lost and undone. And Jesus paid the price. That's what this table is all about. He saves the soul because of the shed blood. You know, this morning as I stand here, I thank the Lord for His unspeakable gift. 
it's unspeakable because we, we don't have a word. I don't know of a word that exists in any language, anywhere, on all of this world, in any place that can sufficiently say thank you for what Christ did for me on the cross. So this morning, as we come to this table, let's honor him and give him the worship, the love, and the praise he deserves. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you now, Lord, to... Lord, just help us as we come to this table to remember. Lord, that all that was done, that we might come and remember what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. Lord, help us to remember the thoughts of a loving Savior. Lord, the things we learn from Christ, grace and mercy, forgiveness. Lord, had it not been for these things, how would we ever, how would we ever be made right with you, Lord? So today as we come to this table, Lord, help us to take a, a long, hard look at ourselves. Lord, help us to ask for forgiveness in those places in our life where we need that forgiveness. Lord, help us to give freely that forgiveness. Father, as I thought about Judas. And Lord, I thought about that you gave him that opportunity. Lord, if Judas had taken that opportunity, and he had not betrayed you. Lord, it wouldn't have mattered because you just still went to the cross for my sin. Judas was still a sinner, but you loved him. Lord, you didn't love his sin, but you loved him. Lord, you didn't want him to leave this world lost and undone, but he did. Lord, forgive us where we fall short. Lord, help us when we don't understand. Lord, help us when we come to a place of judgment of others. And Lord, we can't see grace or mercy in that place. Lord, touch our hearts. Touch our minds. Lord God, help us to be like Jesus. Father, as we come to the end of this service and we'll have a time of invitation, Lord, I pray you'd allow the Holy Spirit to work and move here in this place to, to draw unto you that one that may be here this morning who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, that maybe somewhere outside the walls of this church there's someone who doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior. And Lord God, that same Holy Spirit would draw them unto salvation through Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to be humble before you now. Lord God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.